Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 134. Last week, we met professional apologist John Martinoni and had the first half of my interview with him. This week, we'll finish that interview. The Mafia has an interesting and logical hierarchy. At the top of the food chain is the boss of the bosses. Then there's the territorial bosses. Next are the capos. Finally, you have the soldiers. The Sicilian Mafia is all but gone in America, but we have another kind of Mafia-like criminal organization. It's called the Lavender Mafia, and it has overwhelmingly infiltrated the USCCB. Because Chicago is the primatial sea in America, Cardinal Blaise Supich is the boss of the bosses. The territorial bosses are his fellow bishops who belong to the Lavender Mafia. Their capos are the diocesan chancellors and vicars. The foot soldiers are all those priests who agree with the criminal bishops, or they're too cowardly to courageously oppose the heresies and sins of the Lavender Mafia bishops. The Sicilian Mafia made all its ill-gotten wealth through strong-arming, lying, cheating, and stealing. The Lavender Mafia is no different, except they wear ecclesiastical robes that give them the appearance of legitimacy. Make no mistake, the Lavender Mafia is every bit as evil as the Sicilian Mafia. Through the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, they promote abortion, socialism, defunding the police, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, contraception, and illegal immigration. Worst of all, they do it with your money. They lie to you in never-ending appeals and strong-arm the money through parish taxes of the money you give the parish. They depend on your money. Well, you can fight back. Until our bishops begin doing as they ought, we shouldn't give them a dime. So I invite you to download Catholic Bogus Bucks. Catholic bogus bucks are intended to send a clear message to these criminal mafia-like bishops. They're great for wayward parish priests as well. Best of all, they're free to anyone who wants them. Try them out. This Sunday at collection time, assuming you're not happy with your parish priest, you know, the criminals who just haven't been promoted to bishop yet, Drop a Catholic bogus buck in the collection basket rather than your hard-earned money. Message received. And the next time your bishop sends an envelope, he's demanding that you fill with your hard-earned money to finance his criminal activity, fill it with Catholic bogus bucks instead. Catholic bogus bucks are easy to use. All you have to do is download the bucks and print all of them you want. They're free. Let me say that again, they're free. To get your bogus bucks, go to cantankerouscatholic.com slash evil dash bishops. Before we get to John Martinoni, I want to thank you for the help you've been giving to the Emmy and Patrick Becky family in Nigeria. Emmy contacted me the other day and asked me to thank all of you for your generosity. It's been life-saving for the Beckys and their six children. It takes a lot to feed six kids. The family has pledged their prayers for all of you. We're going to continue to ask you to help them this week and next week, so please keep being generous. And I want to thank you, too. You've made me proud that you're six-pack warriors. When we first heard from John Martinoni last week, he told us about how he left the Catholic Church, returned to the Church, struggled with cafeteria Catholicism, and how his apologetical career was launched. He also began to explain to us why all Catholics should at least have a basic knowledge of apologetics. 
This week, John explains to us his four techniques for defending against atheists' attacks. Let's listen. You know, a lot of people have this bad impression of apologetics. Well, you're just arguing with people. No, uh, apologetics just means explaining or defending something or someone. Right. As a Catholic right. apologist, you explain or defend the Catholic Church. Well, here's the th- people. So many times I've had people say, "Well, you know, Saint Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel always, and when necessary, use words." I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard that. Well, number one, based on most experts, St. Francis of Assisi never said that, okay? It's, <laughs> it's not in any of the early biographies of him. The first time you see it, I think, is in some Catholic journal in the early 1900s, you know? And then secondly, St. Francis of Assisi used a lot of words. Third, okay, so you preach with your actions, Then someone is interested, well, why is this person helping the poor? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? And they come to you and they say, well, why are you doing? Well, because of my Catholic faith. Okay, so what does your faith teach? Uh, well, (laughs) you sooner or later, you have to answer people's questions. Yes. Nobody's going to become Catholic without ever asking, well, what do you teach about this? What do you teach about that? So that's why apologetics is absolutely necessary to, in order to properly evangelize and catechize, like you said, not just non-Catholics, but Catholics as well. Yeah, a few years ago, I wrote a catechism called Secrets of the Catholic Faith. I called it that because most people don't know the things that are in it. But throughout the book, I use apologetics to explain a lot of the teachings. Whenever I became a Catholic, I had come through, well, I started out as a Southern Baptist and, gosh, went through a whole bevy of Protestant religions. But then whenever a man interested me in the Catholic faith, by that time, I was agnostic. And so I made him prove everything, and I mean prove Every single teaching of the church from the, it it took him nine months of working together every day, literally. (laughs) And uh, I mean, everything from the existence and nature of God to the inspiration of scripture. And right away, obviously, I learned the need for apologetics. You know, it was just really important to, because just because somebody would have told me, well, Mary's perpetually virgin. That's the teaching of the church. I said, okay, big deal. Now, right. you know, you've got to know, I'm an American. Americans are naturally rebellious. <laughs> all right. You're going to tell me I'm going, I've got to believe something. Tell me why I have to believe it. Uh, that's exactly what apologetics are all about. And I appreciate you uh, talking about that. John. You talk about four techniques for defending the faith against uh, atheist attack. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. The first one, and I I think you'll like this one, my first tactic or strategy, whatever you want to call it, is called the ignorant Catholic strategy. And (laughs) it's uh, basically all it is is when someone asks you a question about the Catholic faith and you don't know the answer. You say, I don't know. That's it. You know, but you always follow, I don't know with, but I will find out and get back to you. Amen. And then follow through. And then follow through because when they've asked you a question, like I said earlier, that's God opening a door for you. You stick your foot in that door and you do not let it shut. So I'd, I've had people email me and tell me that just giving them permission is how they viewed it when they listened to my talk on strategies. Uh, they said, just having permission to say, I don't know, has freed me up to talk to anybody. This one guy said he was out there talking to Baptist ministers and evangelical preachers, and he was loving getting into situations where he didn't know what the heck they were talking about. And he would say, you know, that's a good question, or that's a good point you're making. And quite frankly, I don't know how to answer you right now. But I tell you what, I know there is an answer, so I'm going to go do a little research, and I'm going to find out, and I'll get back to you. 
So it's he's evangelizing. It's also making him, forcing him to go and do research on his faith, to dive deeper into the faith. So he loved it. So I don't know, but I will find out and get back to you. I always tell people, look, don't give somebody a half-ass answer. Don't give somebody a, your, your best guess because quite literally a soul could be on the line here. Amen. A, a soul, an eternal soul. So you don't just, well, you know, you don't give them some answers because you don't want to be embarrassed by not knowing. I always tell people, do not be afraid to appear ignorant, especially if you are ignorant. Okay? <laughs> Amen. A little humility goes a long way. So I don't know, but I will find out and get back to you. The second strategy I, I call how to I call it how to be offensive without being offensive. And right. all that is is learning how to ask questions. You know, somebody comes to you, starts asking you a question about the Catholic faith. Catholics are always on the defensive, you know. Where is uh, Mary's perpetual virginity in the Bible? Where is infant baptism in the Bible? Why do you confess your sins to a priest instead of going straight to God? Where is that in the Bible? Where does it say you can that works have anything to do with your salvation? Where is that in the Bible? We're always on the defensive. So through this technique, you take the offensive, but you don't want to do it in such a way that people run away from you and don't come back. Like I said, there are these seminars at churches, and, and it's not just here in Alabama. It's all over the country where they're teaching people that Catholics don't know diddly squat about their faith. And all you have to do is ask them this question, this question, this question, and you'll see their knees start to break. And you might see a tear forming in the corner of their eye, you know, and, and uh, they're not going to know how to answer you. And then you've got them. Well, right. so these people are not expecting Catholics to be able to respond to their questions. So when right. they come across a Catholic who does, and then who asks them some questions about their faith, it kind of short circuits all the wiring in their brain. You know, they're like, well, I wasn't expecting that. Well, I don't know how to. So they, their first tendency is to switch the subject. You know, I, I talk about this thing called the doctrinal dance. You know, you know, why, why do you Catholics you know, believe Mary's a perpetual virgin. Well, you start to give them a good, cogent, Bible-based answer. Halfway through your answer, they say, well, why do you think the Pope can't commit a sin? Yeah. Well, then you start saying, well, that's not really what we believe. This is what we teach about infallibility, and this is where it is in Scripture. Oh, yeah, well, why do you confess your sins to a man? They just keep switching. Why do right. they do that? Because they're not prepared for you to have an answer. So when you exactly. do have an answer, it freaks them out. But you don't want to do that if you can avoid it. So what I tell people, this is what I do. I tell someone, I said, look, when they start asking me questions about the faith or attacking my faith, I said, listen to me. I said, if you can prove that the Catholic Church is wrong on any single one, just one of its doctrines or dogmas, I will renounce my faith and I will be worshiping with you shoulder to shoulder this Sunday at your church. Wow. So what have, I, what have I done? And I'm serious. If they sure. ever prove to me the Catholic Church is wrong just one time on one of its doctrines, I'm gone because the church founded by Jesus Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit does not teach error. Amen. So if the Catholic Church is teaching error, it is not the church founded by Jesus Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit. So I'm and serious. And history alone proves that it is the church founded by Jesus. Exactly right. So what have I done? I've got them probably champing at the bit to, you know, they're, they're, they're salivating that, oh, I'm going to pull this Catholic out of the darkness of Romanism, you know? <laughs> and so I've engaged them. And so they start asking me a question. Well, where does it say in the Bible that Mary was assumed into heaven, body and soul? Well, here's the how to be offensive without being offensive Catholic response. Where in the Bible does it say she wasn't? <laughs> You see how easy that is? You, Absolutely. You, you just take what they ask and you turn it into a question and send it back to them. You know, why do you confess your sins to, to a man instead of going straight to God? Where is that in the Bible? Well, is there somewhere in the Bible that says we're not supposed to confess our sins to a man? Well, no. And in fact, when you learn a little bit more about the Bible, it says to confess your sins to one another. You know, James, uh, what's that? James 5, 
five, sixteen. Five, four. Yeah, I was going to say fourteen. But Might be fourteen, right. but uh, I think it's six, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. It's somewhere in there. Um, <laughs> and so, so how to be offensive without being offensive? You know, little things like, um, you know, what I call the one of the two pillars of Protestantism: salvation by faith alone, sola fide. I'm saved by believing in Jesus. No works, no nothing. I accept Jesus into my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. Boom, bam, that's it. I'm headed to heaven. So I asked people, I said, well, okay, that's, I understand what you're saying. Um, but let me ask you a question. Said, if we're saved by faith alone, do you have to love God in order to be saved? And that, you know, you think as a Catholic, you're thinking, duh, yeah, okay. But think about it. If we're saved by faith alone, love has nothing to do with our salvation by definition. So you ask them, well, do you have to love God in order to be saved? Well, um, well, you know, if you if you're truly saved, you'll love God. Well, number one, where does it say that in the Bible? But number two, you're not answering my question. Do you have to love God in order to be saved? Well, uh. Mm, well, you know, if if you're truly saved, you'll love. It's like a broken record. They have no response to the question. Exactly. And so, what I tell Catholics, I said this this strategy is so effective at planting seeds because the other guy has never really examined his faith. Right. The Protestant faith, whether you call it evangelical, Baptist, Methodist, mainline, whatever fundamentalist protestant faith where it differs from catholic faith is razor thin razor yeah. thin so i through your questions what you're doing is you're diving down below the surface well they've never been there before and so it causes them all sorts of problems answering your questions and i i teach people just basic simple questions you can ask on just about any topic once saved always saved the bible all these things and what does it do? Well, it plants a seed, you know, and, and I'll tell people, I said, number one, don't do this if you want people to like you, if you want <laughs> everybody to like you. If you're afraid of somebody being upset with you or something, don't evangelize because truth bothers people. And yes. I mean, just look at what they did to truth himself. They hung him on a cross. So, if you think, oh, I don't want to offend someone, well, you're not being like Jesus. Jesus offended people greatly. So he didn't yes. do it on purpose, but he oh, spoke. sometimes he did. <laughs> <clears throat> well, yeah, I, I agree. Matthew 23 is a good example. But he, yeah. well, well, what I tell people is he offended people, but he was never not charitable. Because right. When he was offending people, what was he trying to do? He's giving them a verbal punch in the nose to try to wake them up to the truth. Exactly. And so when you start asking these questions, some people are going to take it as a verbal punch in the nose, which it is in many respects. So they might get upset with you. They might walk away. They might cuss you. I, like I said, they might say, well, you Catholics are a bunch of blanky, blank, blank, blanks. And, and when they say that to me, I just say, wait a minute, you're leaving out a few blankety blanks. So that's what goes on when you start evangelizing. People are going to get upset. But I always ask people, I said, why does somebody get upset when you ask them a question? Because you've pinged something deep down in their soul, in their conscience. Right. And that's planting a seed. The third thing I tell people is it's the principle of the thing. That's my third strategy. And all this is, is using principles that you draw from scripture to explain truths of the Catholic faith. One easy example is purgatory. You know, in, uh, I guess it's second Samuel somewhere. I can't remember the exact chapters and verses. David is, is punched in the nose verbally, spiritually by the prophet Nathan. David realizes that he has committed adultery. He's murdered. Bathsheba's wife in, in battle, essentially, and, and he repents. And he says, I've offended God. He repents. But what does Nathan say? Well, God has put away your sin. In other words, he forgave you. Okay, you repented. God forgives you. But because you've done these things, the child that is born to you shall die. So what's the principle? The principle is even after sin has been forgiven, 
there is still punishment due to that sin. Exactly. Well, hey, all right, where are we going here with purgatory? Second thing is there's a, cha- a verse in Hebrews 12, uh, verse 22, 23, talks about the souls of the just that have been made perfect. You stop and think about that. It said, the souls of the just, or as Catholics, we would say the souls of those who die in a state of grace, made perfect. Huh, there must be some process by which souls are made perfect. So you got that. Then there's 1 Corinthians 3 about, well, there's this place where you can go after you die to have your works tested. And if you've done works that are, eh, they can be burned up and you will suffer loss as through fire, yet still be saved. Well, where is it you go after you die that your works can be tested as through fire and you can suffer loss, yet still be saved? Is it heaven? No, you don't suffer loss in heaven. Is it hell? Well, you suffer loss as through fire and hell, but you don't get out. So you're not. So there must be some other place. So you put those three principles together. There's punishment due to sin, even after it's been forgiven. There's some process by which the souls of, of the just are made perfect. And there's this place other than heaven or hell. You call that whatever you want. We call it purgatory. And the fourth strategy I teach people is called, but that's my interpretation. Every Protestant you talk to, the, the only universal, the only doctrine or dogma in Protestantism that I would call a universal doctrine is sola scriptura. You go by the Bible and the Bible alone. So what's the thing, though, about the Bible? Well, everybody who picks it up and reads it gets to interpret it for themselves, right? Yep. So I, as a Catholic, have as much right to interpret the Bible as you, Mr. Baptist, Mr. Evangelical, Mr. Fundamentalist. So when I read a verse from scripture and I say, well, what that means is this. You tell me, well, that's wrong. I say, well, but that's my interpretation. Am I not allowed by your theology to interpret the Bible as I see fit? They have to agree with you. Now, they may not like it. They, They may disagree with your interpretation, but they have to give you that you have the right to interpret. So I always tell Catholics, when you're in any conversation with 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 uh, Protestants, Here's what's going on. Under their theology, it's their fallible interpretation of Scripture versus your fallible interpretation of Scripture. Right. right? So there's no way to decide. There's no authority to decide. So you have your interpretation has just as much right and validity as theirs. In Catholic theology, it's their private fallible interpretation of Scripture versus the infallible teaching of the church founded by Jesus Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit. So it's like, we win. You cannot lose, as a Catholic, you cannot lose a discussion about theology, scripture, etc. with a Protestant as long as you keep the church at your back. You can't do it. Amen. Amen. You're absolutely right. Let's wind this down, John, with one final question. I have always been an advocate you know, if I'm if I'm the general of an army and I have an enemy, what I would want more than anything in the world is that enemy's battle plans. So I've long been an advocate that in apologetics we need to learn what the other side is saying. And the one source that well, Carl Keating calls it the Bible, uh, the anti-Catholic Bible, is Lorraine Bettner's Roman Catholicism. Now, I've worn out three copies over the years. Uh, I've used it a lot. How do you, well, do you feel like Catholics should uh, buy and read this book, and why or why not? Uh, I would say yes, if you have the time and inclination. I have actually never read the book, but I could guarantee you, you know, I'm kind of a, an outlier among Catholics in the fact that I've talked to two or 3,000 Protestants in the last 10, 15 years or so. And so I could guarantee you that I have heard everything that is in that book from those Protestants. So the, the, the gist of your question is, like you said, should we know what the enemy, what their plan is, what, what they're thinking, how they're looking at things? Yes, absolutely. Lorraine Bettner's book, Excellent source for doing that. Um, Carl Keating's book, uh, Catholicism and Fundamentalism. You know, you can learn from the Catholic what the Protestant is saying. 
Um, and, and he, you know, he'll, he quotes people. That's the thing with, with, it's always good to get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Right. So that's why when I put something out there about, uh, sola fide, salvation by faith alone, well, there's, there's different, what gradations of sola fide that some believe this, some believe that. So even on that basic tenet of Protestantism, there is disagreement among Protestants. What does sola fide mean? Well, when a Protestant tells me, well, John, that's not what sola fide means. I say, well, you know, you don't have an argument with me. You got it with your fellow Protestants because that's who I learned that definition from, you know, or, or this is who I learned. Uh, you know, I learned from evangelicals about the rapture. And, and, you know, there's there's evangelicals who believe in one rapture. There's some who believe in two, some who believe in three, a pre trib rapture, a mid-trib rapture, a post-trib rapture, one or two, three resurrections of the dead. There's, it's crazy what's out there. Yeah. You know, so yes, learn as much as you can from folks who are, you know, from the Protestants about what they, how they view Catholic teaching. Plus, as you read Protestant material, you learn what they mean when they say we're saved or, or, or their terminology, because some of our words are the exact same between Catholic and Protestant, but they mean completely different things. So you need to learn, understand the vocabulary of Protestants. So yes, it's a, it's a good thing to read books like Lorraine Bettner's and, and, or, you know, anything where you can get the Protestant side of things. But what I always tell them, I said, just start up a conversation with Protestants. If you're at work, you know, do people know you're Catholic? If not, then take a lunch break. And when you go to lunch, make sure there are people around and go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and make the sign of the cross. <laughs> people are like, oh, he's Catholic. I didn't know he was Catholic. They're going to come and talk to you. I guarantee it. Somebody's going to come and try to evangelize you. So just view, view these conversations initially as learning experiences. I'm learning what they think, why they think it, you know, why they believe Catholic. I mean, I'm dealing with a guy now who's like a major nationally known evangelical apologist. And he's trying to tell me that the Catholic Church teaches that Mary saves people. And, and he's using quotes from the catechism, but he's taking out words from the quotes. You know, he, right. and he's he's slicing up the quote to come up with Mary saves people. And I'm like, really, really, you going to go there? But hey, I don't know if he really believes that or that's what makes him money from his folks. Uh, who knows? But uh, that's what people are teaching out there. That well, it's not Jesus that saves in the Catholic Church; it's Mary that saves. Like, oh my goodness, what is wrong with you people? So, but yes. Read Protestant material if given the opportunity. Although I would say don't necessarily do a deep dive in it. You don't have to do a deep dive. Just read one book and pretty much those same arguments you see in one book, they're the same arguments you're going to see in every book, whether they're Baptist, right. Evangelical, Episcopal. All the arguments against the Catholic Church are pretty much the same. So you learn how to defend those arguments and it doesn't matter who you're talking to what denomination they are, where they are on the Protestant spectrum, you're going to be able to to respond to most, if not all, of their challenges and questions. Thank you very much for that, John. Listen, I really appreciate you being with us this week. And I want to ask a little later on down the road, do you think you'd be willing to come back on, uh, come back on the show again? Absolutely, Joe. Would love to. I love doing things like this, especially where I don't have to get on a plane and fly somewhere. Not not that I'm opposed to getting on a plane and flying somewhere. I've done. I've flown. I've talked at parishes and conferences all over the country. But uh, uh, if I can just spend an hour in my office talking with folks like you and and, and your audience, then yes, that is absolutely a good thing. Because I I love for people to know more about what I do and how I do it and and get the materials because like, I, I don't know if I've said it on the show, but I, I know I told you everything pretty much at my website is free. Free is a good price. And, and the whole point of it is teaching people about their faith. That's Amen. all 
That's why I know that's why you do what you do. It's why I do what I do. So Catholics can better understand their faith and by better understanding their faith, grow closer to Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for being on the show, John. We'll talk to you again soon. All right, Joe. God bless. It's tough being a Catholic these days. With the weak and criminal bishops ruling here in America and the refusal to teach and stand up for Catholic doctrine, as well as one blatant heresy after another coming from Pope Frank, Catholics are leaving the church in droves. Much of the hemorrhaging of the body of Christ is a transfusion of those souls into Protestantism. You can protect yourself from anti-Catholic attacks by knowing the apologetical arguments on key issues anti-Catholic Protestants use. I'm not saying that you have to become an apologist. I'm just saying that when you know the arguments, whether you ever use them or not, you'll be able to come away from any discussion knowing what you believe and why you believe it. You'll be sure enough about our holy and ancient faith to remain a member of Jesus' mystical body of Christ. If you want to read some good books or listen to recordings with apologetical arguments, just take a look at the links in my show notes. You can access those show notes on cantankerouscatholic.com slash episodes, then click on this episode. And remember to leave your comments below the show notes to tell me what you think about John Martinoni's interview. As you know, I don't like asking for your financial support. I always want a win-win situation whenever possible. Well, I've got a way for you to help this apostolate without you having to do anything you're not already doing. Everybody shops on Amazon. I've developed an affiliate relationship with Amazon. When you visit cantankerouscatholic.com and click on the episodes page, blog page, or about the show page, on the right-hand side of the page you'll see Amazon ads for Catholic books and merchandise. There's no price difference from Amazon's site, but if you click on something you're interested in and buy it, Amazon will pay me a small commission just for you clicking on that ad. It doesn't stop there either. Anytime you're on Amazon and find things you want to buy, send me the link to the items and I'll send you another link to click when you're ready to buy. You won't pay a dime more for the item, but Amazon will pay me a commission. That way you can help to financially support this apostolate just by doing what you were going to do anyway. Remember, visit the episodes, blog, and about the show pages to find Catholic books and merchandise, and send me links to other things you want to buy on Amazon, and I'll send you the links that will pay this apostolate a small commission. And I thank you in advance for your support. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to the blaze. Dr. Anthony Fauci said restarting mask mandates is, quote, under active consideration, end quote, even for those who are already vaccinated, though he did not say whether he supported such a measure. In May, the CDC issued new guidance that said fully vaccinated Americans are no longer advised to wear face masks indoors or outdoors under most circumstances. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic News Pick number four. Hats off to Fox News. A bipartisan group of senators claim that they're close to a deal on a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. We're about 90% of the way there, said Senator Rob Portman. I feel good about getting that done this week. A key source of contention is funding for mass transit. The $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill is different than the $3.5 trillion human capital infrastructure bill opposed by pro-lifers. No, 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 no! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. 
Catholic Catholic News Pick pick number three. three. Hats off to the Catholic vote. Ohio Republican Senate candidate J.D. Vance argued in a speech Saturday that the culture wars are actually a class war waged by the childless left against middle-class American families. In his speech, Vance pointed out that the Democratic Party is now controlled by people who don't have children, The Hill reported. And why is this just a normal fact of American life? that the leaders of our country should be people who don't have a personal indirect stake in it via their own offspring, via their own children and grandchildren, Vance asked. Wow, that's just incredible. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number two. two. Hats off to the Daily Wire. 55-year-old Marlo Spaeth had worked for Walmart for nearly two decades and enjoyed her job immensely. Spaeth, who has Down syndrome, struggled to adjust to a change that Walmart made in her work schedule. When she requested an adjustment, the retail giant fired her. After a six-year legal battle, Walmart was ordered to pay Spaeth $300,000. Sam Walton would be ashamed of how his company has turned out. Despicable! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick Pick number number one. one. Hats off to the Daily Wire. Former Olympian and pro football player Herschel Walker called out American athletes who turn their backs on the American flag or simply act embarrassed to be American. People think I'm very harsh when I say this. This is the United States of America, and if you don't like the rules here, and there's no doubt we can make some things better, but if people don't like the rules here, why are you here? That's awesome, dude! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. I am hard, but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. One day, two men stood outside the parish church after Holy Mass and carried on a conversation. One said to the other, Why, Bill, you put on some weight. Don't you work anymore? I work about 24 hours a day, replied Bill with all seriousness. Impossible, exclaimed his friend. Not with the system, Bill began to explain. I work 12 hours down at the shop and around the house. Then I support the parish, the diocese, and mission work. That money even works while I'm sleeping. Bill understands the precept of the church that the faithful are obliged to assist with the material needs of the church, each according to his own ability. The church can't exist without the financial and prayerful support of its parishioners. Although no one likes to compare a parish church to a business, it does indeed meet anyone's criteria for a business. Every business has a deliverable, a product or service. Your parish's deliverables are baptism, confirmation, the holy sacrifice of the mass, confession, anointing of the sick, matrimony, spiritual consolation, spiritual growth, and aid to others in the form of the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Every business also has overhead, and your parish's overhead is at the very least the cost for grounds and building maintenance, heating, cooling, lighting, cleaning, office expenses, water, sewer, and all the little perks you enjoy from your parish. If there's a school, well, that usually costs more than the tuitions being charged. And if your parish is involved with special services to people in need, that is itself a tremendous cost in remaining true to Christ's command to go out into all the world. 
every business must make a profit. This is where people get a bad feeling in the pit of their stomachs when talking about the parish church as if it were a business. But the parish church must take in more than it spends or it can't survive. Not only must a parish take in at least as much as it's required to spend, but it must take in more. Why? For the same reasons you have a savings account. What happens if the pipes freeze and break? What happens if the heating system goes out? What happens when office equipment breaks down or wears out? If a parish is only taking in as much as it spends, how are these things paid for? They must be taken care of from the parish collections that exceed expenditures. Apart from the cold business aspects of parish finances, there is also the spiritual aspect. The church does have the fifth precept, a church law, that we're all required to obey in conscience. You shall help to provide for the needs of the church. That law of the church is more fully explained in the Code of Canon Law. The Christian faithful are obliged to assist with the needs of the church so that the church has what is necessary for divine worship, for apostolic works and works of charity, and for the decent sustenance of ministers. This canon law and the fifth precept have as their basis some of the biblical writings of St. Paul. According to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, Now concerning the contribution for the saints, as I directed the churches in Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is putting something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that contributions need not be made when I come. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, Paul says, The point is this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that you may always have enough of everything and provide in abundance for every good work. It's a pitiful commentary on modern Catholics that statistically only 10% of parishioners provide 90% of the parish income. Are we to believe 90% of parishioners are thoughtless and selfish? That would seem to be the implication. That Catholics don't give as they should seems totally unreasonable to me. After all, you wouldn't dream of expecting the products or services of any business without having to pay for them, or taking services from government without paying taxes, both of which are compelled contributions. Why would you expect the parish to be able to provide all it does without making a decent free will contribution? Aha, yes, the free will contribution brings up another matter. Many Catholic theologians have taught that the Old Testament law of tithing, that is, giving 10% of your earnings, is still in force under the New Covenant, while others claim it's merely free will contributions from your excess. Both are acceptable theological thought because the Church has never ruled on that one way or the other. But for those who agree with the tithing concept, many of those theologians promoting a gift of 10% tell us that 5% is actually sufficient in America because the government has chosen to take on some of the church's responsibilities through entitlement programs with your tax dollars. Regardless of how you view what's acceptable, the bottom line is you need to begin examining your conscience to determine how well you're obeying the fifth precept of the church. It's wrong that only 10% of your fellow parishioners provide 90% of the parish income, and it's equally wrong that you should expect them to carry you while you enjoy all the benefits without contributing to the expenses. But what if you lack resources to make a contribution to the collection basket? If you honestly can't contribute to the parish financially, then you're obligated to contribute in other ways. For example, if your pastor has to pay someone to clean the church, why can't a group of you organize and take turns cleaning up? Who mows the grass? Maybe you could. 
Maybe you have the wherewithal to teach a class or chaperone parish kids on outings planned by the parish. There are countless ways you can contribute to the parish if you can't afford to make financial contributions. Nigeria is a rough place to be a Catholic. Catholics aren't only persecuted there, but the terrorist organization Boko Haram regularly slaughters Nigerian Catholics with machetes. Despite this, the Catholic Church is growing in Nigeria at an enormous rate. The Nigerian soil is fertilized with the blood of martyrs. My book cover designer is a young Nigerian Catholic mother. Her name is Emmy. She attends Mass and goes to Eucharistic adoration every day, risking her own life to do so. The persecution of her family has recently gravely increased. Emmy just had her sixth child who's having health problems. Her husband Patrick has been forced out of work because he's a Catholic. The National Bank of Nigeria has blocked funds from the United States. I spent two weeks trying to find a way to get money to Emmy's family. We finally figured out how. Emmy has a friend in Great Britain who will forward the money to her. All I could afford to give her was $100, which was the widow's mite for me, but by her response, you'd have thought that I sent her a million bucks. The baby's sick, the family's hungry, there's no income, Emmy can't do her graphics work because of the sick baby, and Emmy and her family live under the constant threat of death just because they're Catholic. By comparison, you and I don't have any problems. For the next several weeks in all of my show notes, I'm going to include a link for you to help Emmy's family. I'll send her the money given every week. If you're already helping this apostolate and can't do any more, please stop giving me the money and help Emmy and her young family. God will help this apostolate somehow, but this Nigerian family needs your help badly. Please be generous. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. Edith Stein. She said, The nation doesn't simply need what we have. It needs what we are. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. A man whose face was almost hidden by the upturned collar of his expensive overcoat stood in the shadow of steel girders of a bridge. He looked down into the water 50 feet below. He reached into his pocket for a final cigarette before making his escape from his troubled life. Just then a homeless guy walked by and saw the man standing in the shadows. He asked, You got any spare change, mister? The man smiled in the shadows and said, Spare change? What difference could that make now? Sure, I've got some spare change. I've got a lot more than that. He pulled out his wallet. Here, take it all. He pulled about $2,000 out of his wallet and thrust it toward the homeless man. What's the idea, asked the homeless guy. It's all right. I won't be needing it where I'm going. He glanced into the water. The homeless man took the cash and held it uncertainly for a moment. Then he said, No, you don't, mister. I may be a beggar, but I ain't no coward, and I won't take money from one either. Take your filthy money with you into the river. He threw the bills over the railing and into the water. Then the homeless guy began to walk away as he said, So long, coward. The suicidal man gasped. Suddenly he wanted the homeless man to have the money he's just thrown away. He wanted to give, but couldn't. Give. That was it. He'd never tried that before. To give and to be happy. 
He took one last look into the murky water, then turned and began following the homeless guy. To commit suicide isn't only against God's law, but it's also an act of cowardice. A person who wants to end it all by killing himself is afraid to bear the burdens of life. He's selfish. He refuses to give and be generous. But by taking his own life, his greatest problem begins. Judgment. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.